Thank you. Um, I think I made a joke about my union a couple of years ago, but I won't do it here because it's a bad word. Uh, unionen, it's called? Yeah, it means... Unionen. Unionen. It means uh, the union. Uh, yes, and um, I thought you were going to ask about my last name, Soderqvist. There's a Q and a V. It's incredibly difficult when I go abroad. So I, yeah. Well, my name is Fredrik Soderqvist. I work at Unionen. Uh, we are a white-collar professional union in the private sector in Sweden. Uh, and we start with that point, I think. Uh, most countries don't have private sector unions for white-collar workers, but we do in Sweden. Uh, and we're also the largest union in Sweden, strangely enough. And we organize, well, essentially office workers, you could say, throughout the private sector. But office worker, it's, um, it's a bit of a stretch, I'd say. We have professional footballers as well. Uh, we have self-employed members as well. Uh, managers, IT professionals, accounting assistants, accountants. It's very wide and broad. Uh, and the reason for this is that Unionen is a collectivistic union, you could say. Uh, in Sweden, there's two types of white-collar unions. It's the academic unions, and then there's the more collectivistic unions. And our goal is to unite and represent members, quite basically. But doing this is, of course, uh, a whole other story, uh, especially in a country which is very high union density and very high collective bargaining density. Uh, I think about 70% of workers in Sweden are trade union members and 90% of the labor market is regulated by collective agreements. And I will explain a little bit about this and how this fits into the future of uh, trade unionism, the future of the cooperative movement, uh, and a little bit about the future of work, essentially. Uh, and I, I would like to start uh, by saying that I'm very happy to be here and listen to all these interesting uh, stories from a very dynamic part of the world that we up in Northern Europe don't really hear so much about. Uh, all these examples are very different and ranging. Uh, Trevor said that all cooperatives are like snowflakes, they're different. But I think that we all have the same goal and it's about empowerment. And empowerment is an incredibly important question uh, these days. Uh, it's very interesting because empowerment is back on the agenda after about 30, 40 years of there only being one way of doing politics, which is, you know, often derived from economic models from the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm an economist at the Union, so I do a lot of theoretical work. I'm also doing a PhD right now in industrial economics, where I look at trade union dynamics, I look at labor law and economics, and I look at a lot of these microeconomic models that we have founded our view of the world about for the past 30 years, and kind of why they are missing the point. Uh, and like I said, we're living in a time where we're questioning these old truths that have been very prevalent. Uh, and we just had a big discussion of how we can use capitalism to fix the idea of income inequality and poverty. Uh, when I started this job, this was not a very uh, big topic in Sweden. But these five years I've been working here, it's become very mainstream to talk about you know, bargaining power, talking about wealth distribution. Uh, a funny thing is uh, the employers' associations in Sweden, they always used to throw OECD reports at us saying, Oh, employment protection is too high, the unions are too powerful, but within a couple of years I had to, I, I had to stop reading these reports as carefully because I, I had to read them carefully to look at faults in their reasoning. Now I'm the one throwing OECD and IMF reports <laughs> at the employer. So this is the point I'm trying to say here, is that the consensus about what is correct in a market economy is, is changing very rapidly. And the role of unions in this is becoming very central in these economic discussions we're having. So, but we've had about 30 to 40 years of, of uh, union decline in this era of shareholder value or new liberalism or new classical economics applied, where the invisible hand is supposed to solve all our problems and interventions in markets are always going to lead to worse results. Uh, but during this time, I think Sweden has, for some reason, has, we have fared fairly well. We've, of course, had problems in Sweden. Unions have been struggling in Sweden as well. But considering that 70% of the workforce are still union members and collective bargaining coverage is still very high, I will get into a little bit why this is uh, in my talk. And I will get back to the fact that this model is more resilient than other models. So, and then I actually need to go back to the 1850s. I'm very sorry. But 
the history of the Swedish trade union movement has a lot to do with the fact that Sweden was very late to industrialize. So in 1850, Sweden was one of the poorest countries in Europe. Uh, we had a very backward legislation where guilds regulated the market, whereas the rest of Europe had abandoned these structures for the more uh, Manchester school of economics that was you know, guided by Adam Smith. You shouldn't have central regulations. You should have free trade. You should have contracts regulating employment agreements and all these things. So in the 1850s, there was a big wave of uh, deregulation in Sweden. Sweden was liberalized, essentially. One immediate consequence was that one million people in a country of about four million people left the, <laughs> left the country. Uh, they went to the United States, a lot of them. Some of them came back. But in the 1870s, industrialization started picking up as foreign investment came to Sweden. So what happened was that we used to have this very, in some cases, ancient regulation regarding, for instance, farmhands, how they would be treated by their farmers. And this was replaced by industries who came to these local areas, people moved there, and they were supposed to uh, have their work arrangement regulated in a contract. Everyone was supposed to have an individual contract. Well, what happened? Well, these contracts, uh, they, they sucked. <laughs> And they were not individualized, they were standardized. And this is you know, a common thing we talk about in economics, it's transaction costs. Employers want to have to deal with their employees with as low a cost as possible. So why making an individual contract for labor that's highly replaceable? And this is when the modern trade union movement was formed. They were realizing that everyone was getting the same crappy contracts. If they all went together and negotiated collectively, they could change the contract and influence the, the content of the contracts and essentially regulate the workplace. This is pretty much the same story in most Western economies, I'd say, uh, how the trade union built up. What differs Sweden from most, and I should say the Nordic countries from most other places, perhaps on the continent it was a little bit similar, was that the employers in Sweden were highly organized. They built very strong cartels in order to handle the unions. And one thing they did was quite pragmatic. They would accept collective bargaining, but they would accept collective bargaining on their terms. They did not want to deal with five unions in one workplace. They wanted to deal with one union. But actually, they didn't even want to deal with the union in one workplace. They wanted to deal with unions across a sector or an industry. So this is how sectoral bargaining came to Sweden. And what advantage did that give the employer? Well, if all the wage increases in all the workplaces were the same, they wouldn't have to raise wages as much. There would be less volatility. They, they hoped there would be less strikes. That was not the case, I would say. But their hope was that they would actually, through what they called solidary wage uh, formation, the employer's capital said this, they would keep wages lower. What happened to this is that it actually forced the unions to centralize, to become more disciplined, and to negotiate on a sector level, essentially. Another thing that happened here was that because the regulation of labor market moved up to a sector, employers and unions eventually caught on to this, would much rather regulate the labor market through contracts, the collective agreements, the contracts. And that led to something which is kind of awkward always as a trade unionist, that you find yourself having a lot in common with some crazy Republicans in the United States. The state should not get involved here. This is a big tradition in our country. We, or it's, it's, I should say it's a case for survival. If politicians get too much involved in the regulation of the labor market, they will do a worse job. And if they do something that helps the unions, well, the next government could be a different one. And that will be bad for the unions. So you create a stability by actually keeping most of the regulation within the social partner regime. And because we have the high density and the high collective bargaining economy, it's legitimate from a democratic perspective as well, because both organizations are democratic. At least ours are. I don't know about the employers, but they're supposed to be. So if we get in now to the future, uh, we still have sectoral bargaining in Sweden to a very high degree. This is important because it's turned out to be a very practical system. So when you talk about unionism and unions in labor economics, you only talk about the unions. You rarely talk about the fact that employers have bargaining power as well. In a country like Sweden where the unions are strong but the employers are also very strong, but also held accountable to what they put into the contracts, the contracts themselves, there's a high incentive to make them not so complicated. Because a sectoral agreement, I mean, apart from wages, which tells that wages have to increase by these many percent at a firm, uh, 
everything else that regulates, you know, work safety, how you handle dismissals and all these things, these contracts are applied at a local level where local representatives apply these rules and regulations. They have to be easy to understand. They have to, they, you know, they have to have a low transaction cost, if I use an economics expression, so to speak. And this gets interesting, and I would say that the talk last night that David Lee gave at our dinner speech was incredibly uh, fascinating for me because it shows that the commodification of hardware is entering another phase. Uh, I mean, the smartphones, we, we consider them commodities, sort of. What's important in these are the app stores, essentially. But the fact that the smartphones can be assembled by someone else, it means that, you know, more people can get access to these technologies cheaper and they can be customized in various degrees. And this will, of course, have implications on, on the labor market at large. It means you can build more cheaply put together different types of solutions in, in manufacturing or whatever. But from our perspective, the commodification of hardware is perhaps the bit, not the biggest concern. Our concern is always the commodification of labor. We do not want labor to be commodified. Uh, the ILO, uh, the statutes of the ILO uh, and the Philadelphia Declaration, which is uh, the first annex to that uh, statute, says that labor is not a commodity, but we do sell our labor. So we do commodify labor to a degree always, but the issue is to which degree should we allow this? And that's something that as a society progresses, we have to consider that you know, our perspective of what is commodification of labor changes. Uh, but as we move into an era where software is getting more important in the world of work, that's when unions become very, very pertinent. And I will return now to the idea of standardized contracts. The platform economy means that the employer can essentially be automated. This is an idea we all are very familiar with. But what happens then is that the code that determines how this digitalized employer tells you how to do work and which processes you should go through and which routines you should go through are essentially the labor contract that you are accepting as an employee. So how are we working with this at Unionen? Well, what we are doing is we have these sectoral agreements, essentially, and one agreement that we've found has been particularly interesting for the platform economy is the temporary agency agreement that regulates temporary agency work. So what we are looking at here is essentially making this piece of uh, regulation, which works together with labor law legislation to some degree, and making it more available to programmers. Because one thing we realize is that programmers are not labor lawyers. And they're not labor lawyers in a very, very narrow field of collective bargaining regulation. So what we are doing is we're trying to have a dialogue with the platforms and see which things are difficult for you to implement, where do you have question marks, and how can we work out a digital common standard in how to implement the collective agreements? Are there any features that you know, have payments in them? For example, we have pensions are regulated through the collective agreements in Sweden to a very high degree. Do you have any issues with the API sending money to the pension funds that we have, that pool resources? So we, we, we are looking at how can we digitalize our regulation in order to make it easier for platform firms in various constellations to do this. And here I will get to co-ops as a, as a final point, because both the co-op movement and the union movement is in huge need of reinventing itself to a high degree. And I mean, I just gave a very, I tried to go through the Swedish union history and the rationale for everything we do, and I probably missed a bunch of things that I should have mentioned as well. But it, it doesn't get interesting until we start to look at the practical solutions in how to attain what we want. We want empowerment and we want fair work, essentially. And this is why I think is so uh, interesting with the platform co-op movement, and from our perspective especially, is the co-op development kits. So a why I'm, not talk I'm talking about venture capital funded companies when I talk about platform firms that we have signed collective agreements with, because I haven't found any platform co-ops <laughs> in Sweden that are um, employers, essentially. There's some co-op, there's some social innovations going on and so on, but from our perspective, we regulate labor, and if labor isn't being sold, then it's, it's not, we, we can't go into that too much. But what my hope is that unions and platform co-ops will start looking at more innovative solutions in, in creating labor contracts here. Because I think it's a good idea, especially in a time when sectoral bargaining is starting to look like a better and better idea. Because sectoral bargaining means that all businesses in the same industry all businesses in the same industry will have the same playing field when it comes to dealing with labor. 
It means that you can avoid social dumping to a higher degree. It also means that it's one labor contract. You can always make you know, some adjustments for individuals in these if they really want this, but it means that you can have the same labor regulation throughout all the platforms. You can start looking at standard solutions for things. So, and there is a big debate about sectoral bargaining right now going on in the world. I know the TUC has just passed uh, at their Congress a, a resolution that they want to switch over from firm bargaining to sectoral bargaining. I know the same thing is happening in New Zealand. In the United States, there's the discussion on a, a better deal, which is a new take on the new deal. So there is a discussion on industrial relations in a whole bunch of countries. But my hope is that, uh, just like the co-op movement, is, is now looking at how can we use new technology to do things better, that unions started doing the same thing. Because we really, the decline in union density means that we can't afford to sit by and not do things anymore. Unions often say, if there's a new phenomenon, we, we can't sign a contract here because we legitimize this new praxis. But the risk is that if we keep saying that, things will develop outside our uh, realm of control and we are not representing our members. And the idea of a union is to have as many members as possible, because with greater numbers, you get greater strength. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I was somewhat coherent.